I'm Adam Rice, and you're listening to Pocket Change, a new podcast that's focused on rethinking conventional economic wisdom. Through education and conversation about how our monetary system really works, I hope to encourage more economically sound decision making from the ground up. Pocket Change is focused on an economic school of thought known as Modern Monetary Theory, or MMT. Once you understand the basics of MMT, it will likely dramatically change the way you think about public policy. For those of you that are new to the show, I highly recommend listening to the first episode of the podcast with Steve Friedman. In that episode, Steve and I discuss a lot of the basics of MMT that will lay the groundwork for future episodes. In today's episode, I had the pleasure of speaking with Bob Hockett, who's a professor at Cornell Law. He focuses on financial institutions, and while he's not as public about being an mmt -er as some of the academics are, he does align quite a bit with MMT. So without further ado, let's get started. I hope you enjoy the episode. Uh, so Robert, thanks. Uh, first of all, thanks so much for taking the time to join the podcast. A uh, little bit of background. Robert and I met um, in early June at a, con or at a small panel here in New York, and he very nicely agreed to come on the podcast. So thank you, Robert. Well, thank you. Robert, do you, do you mind giving a little bit of background on yourself? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, so I'm uh, the Edward Cornell uh, Professor of Law over at Cornell uh, Law School, and I guess that sort of means I'm a law professor. My sort of areas of specialty are in uh, the law of money, the law of finance, uh, so monetary law, financial law, finance regulatory law. Um, I've got a background in central banking as well. Uh, I've worked over at the New York Fed uh, and have uh, worked two stints uh, over at the International Monetary Fund, which is was at least originally meant to be a kind of global uh, Fed. So central banking is a sort of a big part, I guess you could say, of my sort of practical background. Um, I sort of came into the law in a sort of uh, roundabout way, and I came into sort of monetary and financial law um, in, or even business law in a kind of roundabout way as well. Um, this is back in the old days when I was uh, still an undergraduate and then a graduate student. I was originally studying philosophy, uh, a bit of economics, but from a kind of a moral philosophy point of view. And uh, I met a bunch of homeless guys and for a while lived under a bridge with them, sort of trying to figure out why they were homeless. And that kind of began to open my eyes to certain things about the way we conduct business in this country, uh, the way we conduct finance in this country, who has access to financial services in this country, and so on and so forth. So I ended up, you know, doing stuff that I never Ever dreamt I would do, namely, you know, learning about business and learn, learning about finance. Um, but again, sort of originally from that sort of social justice point of view or with that motive in mind and with the practical experiences of these homeless friends of mine uh, in mind as well. So that's sort of still how I come at these uh, subjects. And it's sort of the angle from which I teach them uh, over at the law school uh, as well. Great. And um, how did you get linked up with the MMT community? Basically, I guess there's sort of a couple of different ways this happened. Um, so it became pretty obvious to me very early on, I mean, even back when I was uh, still a law student, that orthodox economics got a lot of things wrong. And indeed, one of the reasons I ended up going to law school uh, in the first place was, you know, I'd been studying uh, economics in this sort of orthodox way at a very sort of high prestige, highly orthodox department. Uh, and was sort of struck by the fact that the economists uh, in that department and in similarly situated schools didn't seem to know anything about institutions, didn't even seem to think that institutions mattered. Um, and when I thought of, of, of institutions, I thought, you know, not of like, you know, buildings with flags in front of them or whatever, but institutions in the sense of things that are legally instituted, right? I thought institutions are basically laws or things that are sort of constructed by law. Uh, and so I had in mind when I used the term institution, things like, you know, the institution of contract or the institution of marriage or the institution of banking and the like. And, you know, the, the, the great economists or the, the, the putatively great economists didn't seem to have any interest in that. That sort of stuff. Um, and so that made me think, if I'm, if I'm going to continue study of economics and sort of work in economics, I really want to do it in a way that's much more sort of what I called at the time institutionally enriched, um, but by which I meant basically, you know, sort of institutionally informed. Um, so, um, you know, that's part of what led me to go to law school in the first place. And then when I started casting about looking for economists who might actually be a little bit more hep to the importance of institutions or at least to the importance of money and uh, credit and debt, you know, I found my way uh, eventually to certain economists who 
were being called post-Keynesian. And it turned out that this term post-Keynesian was a very sort of broad tent. It included Keynes himself, who ironically was not himself a Keynesian, but was a post-Keynesian, and included quite a few other people, people like, you know, Steve Keen, for example, and uh, Paul Davidson and other uh, folk who I think even call themselves post-Keynesians. But it also included under that sort of broad umbrella, uh, people who I subsequently learned sort of identified themselves as standing under another umbrella that's slightly smaller, but is under that broad post-Keynesian umbrella. And they called themselves, you know, the MMT folk. And uh, so I sort of, uh, you know, looked them up, read some of their uh, essays, articles, uh, books. uh, And I thought, God, you know, these people are just like me. They understand that uh, law matters in constituting an economy. And in particular, they're focusing on, you know, the law of money or the sort of legal constitution of money, even if they're not, you know, sort of focusing on the legal aspect of it as such, they're at least focusing on the money aspect of it, which is, again, legally constituted. So I thought these people are kind of fellow travelers. I think we seem to we seem to sort of think alike. Uh, so I reached out to some of them uh, and then I started meeting uh, a bunch of them at the conferences that I got invited to. Um, and among the first I met were, you know, Stephanie uh, and Randy, uh, Stephanie Kelton and Randy uh, Ray. Uh, Fadl uh, Kaboob was one of the first I met as well. And uh, it was amazing. It was like a match made in heaven. I mean, it's, I was sort of thinking, where have you guys been all my life? Why didn't I know about you 10, 15 years ago, even when I was even when I was an undergraduate, you know? So it just it's been, you know, I think we've all been part of the same team ever since. I don't know if I qualify myself as an MMT guy. I, 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 I might, um, but I'm not, you know, I haven't strictly speaking uh, been taught economics by MMT professors or sort of earned a degree at, a, at, a, at an institution that confers economics degrees where there are a lot of MMT people. My degrees are all from other schools that, um, to their shame, don't have MMT people at them. So I, I don't know if I qualify in, in the sort of formal sense, but um, I'm definitely, I, I seem to see things exactly as they do. Uh, and so I think of us as basically being sisters and brothers. I mean, we all sort of seem to see everything the same way. So in that sense, I suppose I fit under that that, that broad umbrella, uh, at least as a fellow traveler uh, to the MMT folk, if not an MMT guy myself. Um, you know, and again, maybe I count as an MMT guy myself, not, notwithstanding my not having a degree that I sort of received um, from learning with MMT folks. But if you can be counted as an MMT guy by virtue of seeing things the same way as the bona fide MMT people do and as being close friends with them and working together and collaborating with them on all manner of project, well, if that would count, then, then I would count as an MMT guy. Gotcha. And is there anywhere you disagree uh, with the MMT crowd? There's absolutely not. There's not a single thing I can think of uh, thus far, at least, that we're in disagreement on. You know, it seems to me that they're just spot on, dead right about everything. Um, I mean, I suppose it's possible that there's something that just hasn't come to light yet that we would disagree on. But I can't think of what it would be because, you know, we've been so close and such intimate friends for so long now. This goes back many, many years at this point. So I I think I've read pretty much everything that they've all written. Uh, they've read, I think, pretty much everything that I've written. And we seem to know each other's work really well. And, and again, we seem to be hanging out together constantly, you know, pretty much. I don't think a week goes by that I where I don't see in person or talk on the phone with at least one or two um, MMT folk um, on one project or another or in connection with uh, one common interest uh, or another. So I would think that if there were any disagreements, that they would have come to light by now, and they just they just don't. I think the principal difference, insofar as there is one, is just a slight difference of emphasis, which I guess makes sense, right? Uh, as a law professor uh, and as somebody who's sort of focused primarily on the, the law that constitutes an economy and the law that constitutes those institutions that are central to an economy, like banking institutions and other kinds of financial institution, and of course, the, the law that constitute debt relations and that constitutes credit relations and the law that constitutes money, my uh, sort of emphasis is, I suppose, one would say more more legal and theirs is more sort of strictly speaking economic. But that's not much of a difference because, of course, I think it's kind of impossible to talk about the economics coherently without at least indirectly talking about the law involved. And by the same token, it's impossible to talk about the law involved without at least indirectly talking about what the economic consequences of those laws or that those legal arrangements uh, are. So 
there might be mild differences of emphasis, you know, in, in what they do and what I do. But but even those are pretty mild. And again, they would just be differences of emphasis rather than differences of view. So, you know, as someone who has experience working at the Fed, is a lot of the stuff that the MMTers talk about and that you write about, is that stuff just kind of understood at the Fed? Is that common sense amongst Fed employees? It seems to be. Yeah, it seems to be at least among most. Um, I can, uh, one way to put it is I, I don't think I've met uh, a single Fed person, right? Somebody who's part of, you know, Fed personnel, be it at the board level uh, in DC or at the regional bank level at the various Fed regional banks, who puts forward positions or who regularly enunciates positions that are at odds with or somehow, you know, profoundly contrary to the way the MMT folks see things. I think that primarily, if not entirely, the Fed folk view, they see what the MMT folk say as basically being common sense, right? I think some of them are almost surprised that it has to be said, uh, but that's not to say that they don't think that it needs to be said. Um, they themselves, I think, in other words, are surprised at um, how widespread uh, mythology about money is, how widespread misconceptions about money or the macro economy or the nature of federal debt or sovereign debt uh, is, uh, I think that they might even be somewhat chagrined by it, you know, sometimes rolling their eyes or sort of shaking their heads. But, you know, it tells you something when even Ellen Greenspan, who I don't think most progressives would think of as being a, you know, a friendly figure, has effectively said MMT stuff, you know, testifying before Congress. And when Ben Bernanke, who I think people probably find a little bit more congenial, but has also said basically MMT stuff, that ought to tell people something, right? That, uh, you know, that if, you, if I, I'm struck by sort of two interesting things, right, uh, in this connection. The first is that the central bankers all seem to get this. And the second is that the private practitioners in the financial markets all seem to get this. They all view MMT strictures as as being almost truisms, right? It's just sort of obviously true to them. And it strikes me that there's, you know, there's an underlying reason why both of those camps, right, central bankers on the one hand and financial practitioners on the other, would all find MMT convincing or simpatico and, and, and basically just right. Uh, and, and that is that their careers, their jobs, in effect, depend on getting financial markets right. If they get them wrong, if, particularly if you're a private practitioner and you get the financial markets or the money markets wrong, you go bust. You might end up going out of business. You might end up being completely ruined, right? Your entire livelihood depends on your getting this stuff right. And somewhat similarly, um, but at maybe one further step removed, central bankers' uh, sort of careers depend on getting the stuff right, too. They might not lose a fortune right away in the way private practitioners would because they're not betting private fortunes on the markets. But they have to kind of get it right in order to know what to do about the markets when it comes to regulating them, when it comes to sort of pr pursuing monetary policy in those markets, which, of course, the New York Fed Trading Desk does every day. They've got to get it right, too, right? Otherwise, they themselves end up sort of paying through the nose, not in, the, in monetary terms, but in reputational terms and in, you know, uh, having, you know, being dragged before Congress or being sort of pilloried in the court of public opinion or what have you. And I think it's actually telling uh, that the one time in recent years, at least, that they really got it spectacularly wrong was when the New York Fed didn't see, you know, in the, in the lead up to 2008, apparently didn't see coming what indeed came in 2008. And that was because the model, the principal macroeconomic model that they used to model the economy was a dynamic stochastic equi general equilibrium model or a DSGE model that abstracted away uh, from banking, uh, from debt, from credit, hence from money. And they got it wrong uh, in a big way, and they suffered a huge reputational hit. Um, and I think it's telling also that almost immediately after that, uh, they contracted with a bunch of consultants to sort of do an internal study to determine what had gone wrong. And those consultants told them that, well, you know, one of the problems was group think. You guys were all sort of thinking in exactly the same way. You weren't listening to any contrarians. And the models that you were using were, you know, kind of idealized, you know, sort of saltwater economic department models rather than sort of real world models. And they've been trying to clean up their act on that ever since. And indeed, one reason that the New York Fed hired me in the first place was they were told that you ought to bring in more contrarians. And so they reached out to me and asked me if I would be willing to help set up this kind of contrarian thinking department over there. 
I sort of joke sometimes that in effect what they were told was that they need an asshole or they need some assholes, you know, who basically buck the, <laughs> the you know, the sort of uh, the, the conventional wisdom around the place. And I guess they saw me as an asshole, so they hired me, right? <laughs> Um, but it's telling, I think, that, you know, I, I don't want to be too, like, ha- hagiographic about the New York Fed or, like, too much of a cheerleader about it. But I'm really kind of struck by and, and very heartened by the fact that when they got it, the one time they got it really spectacularly wrong, and within our lifetimes at least, they acted really quickly to figure out what they had done wrong. And then they acted very quickly once they found out uh, to sort of reach out to an asshole <laughs> like me to kind of help them sort of <laughs> – you know, kind of bring in a little bit of more sort of contrarian type thinking. And now, I mean, the dominant uh, uh, sort of ethos there, as far as I can tell, at least, is is one of uh, a kind of healthy skepticism uh, about orthodox economic models, uh, a ready, a, not only a readiness or willingness, but an even, even an eagerness uh, to sort of track uh, debt and credit relations and to track uh, off balance sheet exposures of financial institutions and to track uh, uh, money that is explicitly viewed as being endogenously issued or endogenously cre- uh, created, all sort of MMT style, even if they won't use that that term. Um, but this is what they seem to be trying to do now, and I think that that's telling. And again, I think it's no accident. You know, they they suffered consequences, even if they were slightly less direct consequences than what private market practitioners suffered in getting things wrong. Um, whereas, you know, if you're a tenured uh, prof at the Harvard Economics Department and you just, you know, kind of proceed on your merry way, uh, modeling economies as though they didn't have money in them or modeling economies as though there were no credit debt relations, um, you know, you don't really get in any trouble as long as you're as long as the sort of proofs that you derive or the theorems that you derive or the, you know, the sort of interesting consequences of certain sets of axioms that you derive are, you know, mathematically interesting, then you're golden, even if what you're doing has literally no connection whatever with what's really happening out there in the financial system or in the broader economy. Well, it's encouraging that, I guess, heterodox thinking is penetrating the New York Fed, at least. Um, What do you think it will take to penetrate uh, the orthodox academic community and also, you know, the orthodox thinkers in Congress that are making these policies? Yeah, I think maybe maybe a few things. When it comes to these, uh, de- let's start with maybe those departments, those orthodox departments. I think, you know, little by, it's hard for me to believe at least that over time, the sort of constant, you know, constantly being told that you're irrelevant or constantly having to see in a certain sense that you're irrelevant. It's hard for me to imagine that continuing without at least some economists in those departments starting to change their ways a bit, whether that mean changing their own methodologies or trying to learn a bit more, or whether it mean hiring some more heterodox people, at least to have a few token heterodox types around, instead of saying that, you know, we're not going to let our departments, our sort of sacred and clean departments be defiled by even so much as one heterodox thinker. Um, It seems to me that they're, they're bound at some point to start at least letting a few of those folk in or starting to do a little bit of that sort of thing themselves. And there is some evidence that that's happening. And, and in some ways it's happening, I think, where it's most surprised. I mean, it's funny, where it seems to be happening most dramatically, in my, at least to my, as far as I can tell, uh, is in the place that you might have least expected it. And that's over at Chicago. So, you know, Chicago, as you know, uh, at least at the business school, the Booth uh, School of Business, there are a couple of economists, two or three there at least, uh, who have gone much more heterodox uh, than the, economic, the economists that you'll find at any of the saltwater, as distinguished from the so-called freshwater places like Chicago, that's supposed to be more conservative. So the first was uh, Raghuram Rajan, who was doing kind of interesting stuff even before the crash. Uh, I actually found him a fairly interesting economist even beforehand because he was sort of interested in financial inclusion and in the way that the need to sort of have collateral in order to borrow, in order to start a business or something, was actually preventing a lot of good ideas from being realized. That was sort of interesting stuff he was doing that I I found sort of refreshing even back as early as, say, 2004, 2005. But when the crash came, he was very quick, I think, to sort of see what had gone wrong and to kind of modify his own sort of thinking and his own writing and his own scholarship sort of in keeping with that. And the book that he published ultimately, I think it was from 2011, called Fault Lines, 
was not a sort of full-on heterodox book, but it was pretty heterodox, at least relative to you know orthodoxy and certainly relative to what passes for orthodoxy at Chicago. And then, of course, um, they took uh, they they hired a couple of other interesting people at Chicago. Atif Mian uh, is another, and I think it's Amir Sufi. Uh, is another. Uh, and these gents have written very, very interesting things. And they basically rediscovered uh, Irving Fisher, which made me very happy because I've been sort of banging the Irving Fisher drum for well over a decade now. I mean, I think Irving Fisher in many ways is a kind of grandfather of a lot of the most interesting uh, stuff that you find uh, among the heterodox economists to this day. But for some reason, he just got forgotten. And he was he was orthodox in his time. He was not considered a heterodox economist in his day, back in the 1920s, 1930s. And then he was one of the sort of pioneers of sort of mathematizing economics in America. He was a kind of a favorite of Milton Friedman's, too. Um, so you know, at first, you don't think that doesn't sound very heterodox. But his, his, his focus on debt structures and on the role that private debt plays in fueling asset price bubbles on the one hand, and then in kind of leading to you know, sort of long-term depression or what he would call debt deflation in the wake of a crash, on the other hand, was profoundly important uh, and was somehow completely forgotten over the course of the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and even well into the 2000s. But has sort of been quietly being rediscovered. I mean, I, I sort of rediscovered him a long time ago. I was banging the drum, but the economists weren't listening, just some law, law professors maybe. And, but now some economists are, and among them are these uh, Antif and, 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 I'm sorry, Amion and, and Sufi, who I mentioned, and they're also at Chicago. So these are that's, that's an orthodox department that has some sort of heterodox people in it now, and I think that's good news. Another case in point, much more modest, but at least it's something, is uh, Yale. Uh, so Yale is primarily a, a seedbed of, of orthodoxy as well. But there are two fairly interesting people there. And one of them, actually both of them are kind of mentors of mine because I did my, my doctoral work in finance over at, at Yale. The one who's most heterodox or closest to heterodox is John Johnacopoulos. And again, here's a case of a guy who you wouldn't have thought to be uh, heterodox because he was a student of Kenneth Arrow's, very mathematically oriented, very mathematically rigorous, at first, you might think, oh, well, that sounds like he's going to be orthodox and he's just going to be spinning models that don't have anything to do with the real world. But here are the two exceptions to that. The first is kind of like the three gents over at Chicago, or especially Mian and Sufi, he also is very devoted to Irving Fisher. He never forgot about Fisher or has never thought of Fisher as irrelevant. And a lot of his work, uh, even going back to 2009, 2010, has been sort of Fisher inspired. And that is, in a certain sense, heterodox, at least by present day or latter day lights. The other thing I think that's noteworthy about him is he was the president, the sort of CEO of a hedge fund. He might still be. It's, I think it's, it was called Ellington Group. It might still be out there. I don't know whether he's still doing that, but he might be. But in any event, so insofar as he was doing that, he had this direct exposure to the actual financial markets that I was talking about before. And that, you know, unlike some sort of autistic uh, economists, that made a difference to him. He learned from what he saw. So he himself, I think, is very open to heterodoxy, at least if he, if he can be sort of mathematically rigorous about it. And I don't think you have to be mathematically rigorous to be a good economist. But I also think it's possible to be mathematically rigorous without being a bad economist. It's very rare. Most of the really mathematized economists are horrible economists because they care more about the mathematics than they do about the, the phenomena that, that they purport to be studying. But John isn't like that. So, so John, I don't think John cares more about the mathematics than the phenomenon. He cares about the phenomenon primarily, but he just happens to be very mathematically oriented. So that's how he does things. So I think he's a mathematically sophisticated quasi-heterodox economist, you could say, over at Yale. The other person who's sort of heterodox at Yale was another of my mentors, one of my principal mentors there, and that's Bob Schiller, uh, Robert Schiller, maybe best known nowadays for either the book Irrational Exuberance or for you know having invented or constructed what's now known as the Case Schiller Housing Price Index, which has turned out to be a very, you know, a revolutionary invention and a very helpful uh, thing that he used actually to forecast the coming housing uh, price crash that did ultimately occur, but 
of course, very few people listened to him uh, at the time, you know, back when he was, you know, kind of crying like a Cassandra as early as 2003, 2004. I think even in 2000 or 2001, he was sounding a warning bell about housing prices, but he was certainly sounding the alarm loudly by 2005. And, you know, people, again, for the most part, didn't listen. And he turned out to be right on that. And I think one reason he was right is that he's not a narrow-minded sort of orthodox theologian type. You know, if you bring to his attention something kind of interesting that's ignored by orthodoxy, and it seems to have some relation to some some phenomenon out there in the real world that is of interest or is of concern, he's much too humble a person just to sort of wave it off and say, oh, you know, our models don't have any room for that, so I'm just going to ignore it. He finds a way to incorporate it into his work. So he's not, I don't, I wouldn't call him a sort of full on or comprehensively or thoroughgoingly heterodox in the way that the MMT folk are, that the, the functional finance folk following uh, Abba Lerner are, or in the way that the uh, sort of neo chartalists or latter day chartalists or post Keynesians are. But he's still quite heterodox compared to most orthodox economists, and certainly compared to other people in his department over at Yale, other than maybe John. Uh, there's some respects in which he's more heterodox than John, and in other respects, he's less heterodox than John. But but the point is that those two guys, I think it, it's it, they're another hopeful sign. And uh, John is finally getting his due. People are beginning to pay attention to him and take him seriously. And Bob, of course, is being taken more and more seriously now, too, as maybe most dramatically represented by the fact that he was, uh, you know, he, he was named a Nobel laureate in, in 2013. So that's kind of a hopeful sign, too. But, you know, I, I should I should I should hedge those observations with a quick you know, remark to the effect that I'm kind of metabolically optimistic. Right. I always, I always say that I, I'm sort of. I tend to kind of look as hard as I can for anything to kind of grasp hold of as a reason to be optimistic. And so I might be, you know, maybe that's like kind of too little too late to be optimistic about that. But but I, I view those as helpful signs. You know, I hope we'll go, you know, much, much further than that. But if even Yale can have a John John Coppolis and a Bob Schiller there who then get respect and aren't just treated as kind of funny eccentrics or, you know, kind of crazies who they, they sort of ignore – uh, and if even Chicago can have people like Rajan and, and Mian and Sufi there, I think that's that at least bodes somewhat well, even if not well and as, as well as I would like to, to, to see. So that's the academy. I think your other question had to do with the Fed, right? Like the Fed board um, in D.C. or was it? something else. I'm trying to remember. It was uh, Congress and policymakers in general. Oh, right. Sorry. Yeah. So, so there, you know, I think in a weird way, it might be simultaneously easier and harder to get Congress to come around on this. And here's what I mean by that. I actually don't think most Congress members know anything about economics. And I frankly, whether it be orthodox or heterodox, and I think further, I'll go even one step further than that. I think most of them don't even really care that much about the truth of the matter where economic orthodoxy or economic heterodoxy are concerned. I, I don't want to overstate that. I think there are some very serious people in Congress who do want to get it right and do care. I think Bernie uh, largely wants to get it right. I think that Elizabeth Warren wants to get it right. I think Sherrod Brown is an especially serious person in Congress who wants to get it right. I think uh, Chris Von Hollen from Maryland, who was in the House for a long time, now is in the Senate, another serious intellect, serious person who wants to get it right. So I, I, I want to be sure to sort of name some of those caveats uh, quickly so that I don't look like I'm sort of, I don't want to paint with too broad a brush here. Uh, but I think that those guys and, and gals are sort of outliers in the sense that they're a little bit unusual in really wanting to get it right on the merits of you know, sort of the, you know, the economic theory that you're acting on. I think they want to be right about that and are, are willing to sort of change their minds if they're shown that the beliefs that they've had up to this point where you know economic phenomena are concerned have been wrong or off or something. But I think most members of Congress, and especially on the House side as distinguished from the Senate side, 
don't really care that much about the theory, whether it be heterodox theory or orthodox theory. I think they're pretty much following the political winds. That's simultaneously then, I think, bad news and good news, right? It can, it's bad news in the sense that if the prevailing wind is that, oh, we have to be austere and that somehow federal debt is a bad thing or it's dangerous or we're saddling our grandchildren with debt or all, any of that kind of crap that you've heard a million times and that I've heard a million times – if, if that's the way people are thinking out there or seem to be thinking, or if, if you get votes by, you know, sort of uh, sounding the alarm about these completely thoroughly unalarming things, then they will sound the alarm and they'll act like Austerians. And so they will follow the Orthodox playbook, even though they don't give a toss about the truth or otherwise of Orthodoxy, right? And that's where it can be bad news. And that's where indeed it was bad news in a really big way, of course, back in like 2009, 2010, 2011. I mean, those, I mean, I, I should, you know, I guess it's a family program. So I'll say those a-holes. <laughs> I mean, you know, they, they made the aftermath of the 2008 crash just so unbelievably worse than it had to be simply because it was their impression that by sounding an alarm about federal debt, they could earn points or earn, you know, sort of higher polling numbers uh, and win elections uh, than if they did something else. And so that's what they did. Uh, and of course, there's still a lot of that out there uh, or among those people. That being said, uh, I think 2018 is very different from 2011 in the sense that that doesn't seem to be the prevailing wind at this point. Obviously, you know, Caligula in the White House right now is busting the budget maximally, right? I mean, the federal budget is apparently scheduled to, I mean, we're apparently expected to go past the trillion mark very, very soon because Donald Trump, of course, is like put in, and his, his henchmen in Congress are cutting taxes way, way, way low. Uh, and at the same time are sort of, you know, turning the screws on certain kinds of federal expenditure. And I'm, I'm sorry, not turning the screws, but are actually boosting various kinds of uh, federal expenditure, especially on the defense side of things. And what that means is that they are the opposite of austerian, right? These are very profligate spenders and very profligate people where tax policy is concerned. Why? Well, again, it's opportunistic. It's not because they've decided that the heterodox economists are right, that the MMTers are right, or that, as Dick Cheney said back in whatever it was, 2003 or 2002, Reagan showed that budgets don't matter, that deficits don't matter. I don't think it's because they you know, believe any of that stuff. I think it's just because they think that's what's politically popular right now. In a sense, that's good news, right? Because all we've got, you know, if these guys, you know, do the job for us to sort of prove that Reagan was right, the deficits don't matter, or the deficit, deficit spending is fine as long as it's being spent on the right things, if they succeed in sort of making that the kind of conventional wisdom again, at least for a while, then what happens is when we retake, when, you know, the forces of light retake the Congress and we retake the White House, and I'm, you know, again, this is the metabolical optimism at work. I'm convinced that when we retake the Congress and when we retake the White House, it's not going to be with some sort of Clintonian type who's basically just a kind of Republican light or kind of a 70s Republican. Uh, it's going to be a, a much more progressive, much more sort of Bernie-ish or, or Liz Warren-ish person. Those people will push progressive policies and the austerian argument will have been killed, at least for the time being by people like Trump and his henchmen. So in that sense, I think we can actually bring Congress around to heterodoxy. And in a certain sense, we already have. They're already, they've already gone heterodox on us. Their only problem is that they're spending the, 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 the newfound money, so to speak, on, you know, kind of, uh, let's say, mischievous, if not, you know, outright insidious things. Um, but that's just, all we have to do is change what the money is being spent on. You know, at least we've got the... We seem to have won the fight against the Austerians for the time being, at least. So with all that said, how would you describe the U.S. economy right now, the health of the economy? I think it's deep down profoundly unhealthy still, Adam. And there are a, a few reasons for that. I mean, so superficially, it's looking kind of good again, right? But it's looking good sort of in the same way that it looked kind of good once the Obama recovery got underway and in the way it looked in the early days of the Bush administration and in the way it looked in the sort of second half of the Clinton era, you know, during Clinton's second term. I think it looks good in exactly the same ways that it looked good then. What does that mean? Well, you know, superficially, it looks good in the sense that, well, 
all right, the unemployment numbers are looking fairly decent um, by, you know, sort of recent standards, at least when you get it down below 4%, that is quote unquote good uh, relative to where things have been, especially since 2008. It's been about 20 years since we last had an unemployment number of that sort. You know, stock market indices are looking pretty good, right? The Dow Jones is still is rising for the, you know, at least the long-term trend is still for it to be rising. Uh, kind of gradually, even if there's sort of setbacks now and again, and likewise, the S&P 500 and all of that. Um, thirdly, you know, housing prices are looking a bit better again. We're not in that sort of state that we were as late as or as recently as 2013 or 2014, where lots of people still owed more on their homes than they actually owned in their homes, right? Where, in other words, people, lots of mortgagers were underwater still. Uh, we seem at the moment still to be in the midst of a, a kind of housing price recovery in the sense that people have at least some sliver of positive equity in their homes again. So, and, you know, there seems to be, you know, job creation, quote unquote, underway and all of that. So those are the superficial indicators. And those are the reasons that people say, oh, it's looking like a good economy. You know, Trump can take a victory lap, blah, 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 blah. But again, I, I, I have to emphasize I have to, you know, I hasten to emphasize that this is exactly the sense in which it was "quote unquote" good in the Clinton years and in the early Bush years. These are superficial indicators, but if you look, if you look more closely at the sort of the underlying phenomena, sort of below the sort of superficial indicators, you see much more, I think, worrying signs, much more worrying uh, phenomena. So start with the unemployment rate at three point nine percent. Well, you know. There are a couple of things uh, to know, right? One is, of course, as you, as you know, and I think it's almost a commonplace out there among people who follow this stuff, unemployment numbers don't track people who have sort of stopped looking for work because they're discouraged. Uh, unemployment work uh, numbers don't track people who have become unemployable because they've had such long periods of time during which they were laid off, you know, after the crash. The real number that one should be looking for if, you know, if you're looking to see sort of what matters is the labor force participation rate. And that's not particularly good. I mean, that's still quite low as it's been since around starting around 2008, 2009. Another thing that's important here is that uh, wages and salaries are not coming up. Um, You know, that's usually, you know, one of the reasons that people celebrate uh, lower unemployment numbers, it's not just that, you know, they're they think fewer people now are without work. Um, but it's also that, you know, that usually ultimately that brings you to a state where employers are sort of having to compete with one another increasingly in order to attract labor. And so they start, you know, competing by raising wages or salaries or whatever. And we're not seeing signs yet of that. And then finally, you know, sort of thirdly or fourthly, I've lost count, sort of related to the fact that the wages and salaries aren't coming up is the fact that sort of job quality has become a real problem. There's a, you know, basically that, that portion of the workforce that's composed by people who have temporary work uh, or have merely part-time work or who have uh, very precarious positions that, you know, they could be fired any moment. There's no job security of any sort and no benefits. The portion of the labor force that's made up by people who have those kinds of employment, much, much higher than it was even 10 years ago. And the 3.9% unemployment rate number that we keep hearing triumphantly bandied by you know, the, the Trump Trumpazoids doesn't show that, right? That just doesn't figure in that number. So, you know, to use that old, that term that I guess was a guy standing who introduced this term, the precariat around 10 years or so ago, the precariat continues to grow, right? Um, and, and the precariat is, I think, the class that really matters if we're looking at employment numbers as health indicators, right? Um, I don't think we can view the 3.9% unemployment number as a healthy indicator if we've got a growing precariat. So that's the story there. Turning then next to, you know, housing prices, um, how, you know, we, well, we're no longer in a housing slump in the way that we were as, as recently as 2013, 2014. People forget that there's a very straightforward reason for that. And that reason has three, you know, is named by a word that can be stated in three letters, F-E-D. It's the Fed. Uh, As you might remember, Adam, back in, um, this is in October of 2012, the Fed announced that it was going to embark on a new, yet another iteration of QE that it was going to call QE3. And pursuant to QE3, the Fed undertook to, or committed to buy 85 billion dollars worth of mortgage related assets off the markets every month 
Now, $85 billion a month, that gets to be real money pretty quickly. And the idea here was essentially to put a floor underneath what we're still slowly cratering housing prices as of you know, 2012, and then gradually to raise housing prices. Because the theory here, and the theory turned out to be right, is the more mortgage-related assets you buy, um, the more the, the more highly valued the underlying mortgages themselves become, and hence ultimately then the more highly valued the homes that are connected to those instruments become. And so, in effect, we've got a, a kind of artificially maintained floor under housing prices right now. That's all thanks to the Fed. Now, that's not a problem as such. If that's what you got to do, that's what you got to do. And I'm a great advocate of, and I've written quite a bit on, I've written stuff that, you know, 10 years ago was called totally wacky, but now is becoming almost mainstream because people seem to be kind of coming around to this. I've been a big advocate for a long time of the Fed just buying up um, assets whose prices are what I call systemically important prices. I call them SIPPIs, sort of by analogy to SIPPIs, you know, systemically important financial institutions. You know, one way of thinking about monetary policy as conducted by the Fed, you know, the idea is they want to keep interest rates at a certain level. That's because we decided that interest rates are systemically important prices, right? It's the money rental rate. That's a systemically important price because it's an input to so many other prices. And my argument has always been that, well, there are, that's, that, that, that's right. That's a good thing, right? It's a good thing we do open market operations to sort of control the interest rate because it is indeed a systemically important price. But as soon as you realize that the point here is the systemic importance, then it's just a short step to realizing that there are other systemically important prices too, including the prices of housing, right? Housing is the by far the most important middle-class asset, the, the principal source of middle-class wealth in this country. And indeed, even of lower middle-class and, and of non, of, of poor folks' wealth when they own their own homes. So, you know, the housing prices are systemically important in that sense. And so if the Fed intervenes to sort of keep those up, I think that's a good thing. It is, however, I think a bad thing that it's necessary. You know what I mean? That it's a, it's a bad sign that we still need the Fed to do that because we didn't need the Fed to do that before 2008. And indeed, we didn't need the Fed to do it before the housing bubble either. You know, if you go back to about 1995 or 96, when things really began to kind of inflate in the housing markets, that was a housing system that was basically privately financed, but with considerable public help through Fannie and Freddie. And that was a system that they, we put in place during the New Deal uh, era. We put that in place in the 1930s, and it worked beautifully for 60 damn years, uh, leaving to one side the red line, you know, the, ra the racism that was horrible, but was not in a, that was a bug rather than a feature of that program. In other words, you can have federal housing uh, finance programs without racism, which indeed we moved to doing starting in the, uh, in the 1980s. But so that that plan, the design of that plan was, was, was exquisite, and it worked beautifully for about 60 years. Then we let private investment banks get in on the act and start privately securitizing mortgage loans in the 90s. And that's when everything came a cropper and went to hell in a handcart. But back to the main point here, the point here is that during that period, that 60-year period, you didn't need the Fed to put a floor underneath, underneath housing prices by buying up a bunch of mortgage-related uh, you know, private label securitized mortgage loans or, 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 or PLS, right? PLS bonds or so-called mortgage-backed securities, MBS. You didn't need that. You could do it with Fannie and Freddie providing a secondary market to primary lenders um, who were now more willing to lend because they knew that they could shed those loans. They could sell them to Fannie and Freddie if they ever wanted to get rid of them. If we went back to that kind of system, um, we could do that again, and that would work well, and then we wouldn't need the Fed propping up housing prices. So the fact that the Fed is doing this is good, but the fact that it needs to do it is bad. And this is yet another sense then in which I think the underlying fact of our economy as we currently find it is, 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 is problematic. Finally, thirdly, and this sort of connects up both with housing and with um, employment, the inequality problem that finally it's sort of safe to talk about without being accused of being engaging in class war. Uh, this is another thing that's been kind of a bugbear of mine for 14 or 15. I mean, basically, ever since I entered the academy, ever since I've been a prof, I've been writing about wealth and income inequality and how that's not only a, a reflection of certain injustices in our economic arrangements, but how it's also a systemically dangerous thing. So two things here. First of all, um, it can be shown, and indeed a bunch of my work has been devoted to showing, that there's a very direct causal link between long-term wealth and income inequality on the one hand – 
and financial and macroeconomic volatility and ultimate instability and dysfunction on the other hand. In other words, what happened in 2008 itself can be viewed as the culmination of 30 straight years of widening and worsening inequality, both in respect of wealth and in respect of incomes. So average Americans' incomes in terms of wages or salaries began to stagnate around the mid-1970s, and they have stagnated ever since, right? In real terms, we're not doing any better wage-wise and salary-wise than we were doing doing during the Jimmy Carter administration, maybe not even since the Richard Nixon administration. All the while, the top, literally the top one percent of the top one percent, you know, the, I mean, that's that's kind of amazing, right? The top ten thousandth of uh, sort of quin, uh, sort of whatever aisle that would be called, like decile, quintile, the top ten thousandth aisle. Um, has been seeing its, of course, share of of the nation of the nation's wealth growing just enormously, and of course, its share of the national income growing enormously. That skew has been happening straight on, you know, again without any interruption, without any serious interruption since the ni- late nineteen seventies. Okay, so that by by two thousand eight, we had reached a, a degree of skew. That was last seen in this country, guess when? Any, any idea when the last time was that we had that same skew? Before the Depression? Bingo, 1928. <laughs> exactly. And that's not a bloody accident, right? It's not just a kind of an interesting and mysterious coincidence, right? It's, it's it, it, precisely the same thing happened because there's a direct link. Uh, the paper, I have a couple of papers on this, but the easiest one to remember the title of is just called Income Inequality and Financial Fragility or, or, and Market Fragility. It just sort of empirically demonstrates this and gives a kind of a, a whole sort of theory as to why this would be and then demonstrates that the theory is the reality through uh, a bunch of empirical you know, sort of number gaps. And, and, and chart graphing and so forth. In any event, this problem is not, we've done nothing about it since the crash. You know, in 2008, we did nothing about it. And in many ways, the problem's become even worse because the one source of wealth that people below the top of the distribution did have, namely their houses, of course, dropped uh, in value. Uh, and again, insofar as uh, these people at least have some positive equity, you know, some sliver of positive equity in their homes, yeah, it's basically because the Fed is maintaining those values. But I think we're, we, what we have to do ultimately is deal with that underlying inequality problem because that itself is connected, of course, to the job and employment problem. I mean, indeed, the, the fact that we have a really nasty employment story is part of the reason that we have the inequality story. Uh, And then the fact that we have the inequality story is a big part of the reason why we have the housing story. And indeed, the growing private debt levels story, right? It was growing private mortgage debt in the lead up of 2008. Since then, it's been, as you know, probably better than most, we've had growing student debt, growing credit card debt, growing other kinds of private consumer debt, credit card debt, another huge one. All of these have become huge debt, ca- private debt categories in recent years, even while mortgage debt continues to be a big category. And so, you know, we've got an economy that's completely reliant now, completely dependent for consumer expenditure that keeps the economy growing and thus keeps people employed, entirely dependent on consumer debt. Whereas back up until the early, mid, say, 1970s, The principal source of consumer expenditure was people's incomes. They were spending out of what they were earning. They weren't spending out of what they were borrowing, at least not in the same degree, right, in the same measure. So ultimately, I think we have to deal with that inequality problem, and that means we have to deal with the income problem. And I think there are two ways we're ultimately going to have to do that, right? One is I think we probably need the strength uh, to revive the labor movement, and we have to unionize not just traditional occupations, but we have to unionize the occupations that are now dominant among the so-called precaria, you know, the part-time workforce, the Uber drivers, the so-called sharing economy folk and so forth. We need some sort of bargaining power for those folk to be able to get higher wages. We need much more legislation either to mandate or require that or to facilitate labor unions doing that. I think we need uh, an employer of last resort function. In other words, a job guarantee that so many of my MMT friends have been uh, pushing so effectively and so uh, beautifully, actually, in the last six months or so since it's become sort of a thing among uh, a number of Democratic legislators. That, too, would provide a floor. One, you know, If you go back to this sort of systemically important prices idea that I mentioned a moment ago, 
prevailing wage and salary rates, that's also a systemically important price, at least as important as housing prices. I think the same argument then that can be made for open market operations to, to, to determine the interest rate can be made with respect to what I'll call open labor market operations to keep wages and salaries high. And that's what an ELR would do. That's what an employee of last resort function, i.e. a job guarantee would do. We should treat wages and salaries as a, as, a, as a systemically important price and say that they should never fall below a certain threshold. And that too will do wonders to uh, sort of address the inequality problem. And then finally, thirdly on this, I have a book coming out on this very shortly, you know, within the, within the next couple of months with Yale Press. I think we have to develop means of getting more capital into the hands of more people. So, you know, another way of telling the story of what's happened over the last 30, 40 years, I mean, since the mid, say, 1970s, is that labor incomes have not shown any increases over these last, you know, three or four decades. Um, but capital incomes have. That's just another way of saying that that's ex- essentially the explanation for why the top 1% of the top 1% have gotten all of the income growth in this country over the last 40 years. It's because their ca- their income derives from capital ownership, from what they own, from wealth, in other words. And so the, the gains that come of wealth ownership are astronomically high. And as we know, since, you know, Piketty mania broke out in 2014, you know, that is his famous equation, you know, R is greater than G, that basically the returns to capital exceed the rate of growth of the economy as a whole. That itself tells you why there haven't been gains to labor, right? If the if the gains of the economy as a whole are less than those to one component of the economy, that means that we have like basically negative growth with respect to other you know sort of sectors of the economy. It's all been going to the capital owners. So my thought is that another thing we ought to be thinking about doing, and that's what this forthcoming book is about, is getting more capital into the hands of more people too, so that you, Adam and I, Bob and our friends and other basically all Americans have income that's coming through ownership of shares in corporations as well as the income that they have coming in the forms of their salaries or their their, their wages. Uh, and it turns out it's very easy to financially engineer this. This is sort of what the book is about. Basically, by replicating the same financial engineering methods that we pioneered in the 1930s, to make homeowners of more people, and that we've started doing, that we developed then on the pattern of the housing finance programs in the 1960s to enable more people to finance their higher educations, we can do the same thing with capital ownership. We can finance the spread of a much wider spread of capital ownership uh, among the population of Americans. I call it, I call the, the sort of the guiding ideal here, I call the income compositional symmetry principle. So that probably sounds at first kind of weird or like a mouthful or something, but the idea is Think of the uh, the income composition of the country as a whole. Let's say, you know, X percent of value added to the economy every year is attributable to capital and Y percent of value added to the economy every year is attributable to labor. Then if the economy as a whole has an X slash Y division of its, you know, sort of value added, then every individual should have the same division, right? So if it's 90 percent capital, 10 percent labor for the country as a whole, then it, ideally, it would be 90% capital, 10% labor for you, Adam, and for me, Bob, right? We would be deriving 90% of our income from capital ownership, too, and 10% from our wages or salaries. Now, it's probably going to be a while before we could ever realize precisely that ideal. But if we were, if we could view that as the, as the ideal end state to which we ought to be moving, and we could adopt policies that take us progressively closer and closer to that ideal – Think about what that means. It means, first of all, the inequality problem diminishes. Now you, Adam, and I, Bob, are much less poor, so to speak, relative to, you know, big shot capital owners who own, you know, the the tiny percentage of Americans who own something like 95% of all corporate shares and bond instruments and so forth. It also means that you and I don't have to get ourselves into all sorts of consumer debt in order to pay for things and thus add our effective consumer demand to the economy and thereby keep the economy growing and keep people employed, right? We don't have to do that anymore. That means in turn, we don't have the same sources of financial volatility that we've had in recent decades, all of which sources have been rooted in some crazy, wacky, newfangled, new form of consumer debt, 
or uh, uh, mortgage debt, right, where most of us become debtors. And then again, the, the big shots who own all of the capital are the credit are, are creditors. They they own the mortgage backed securities, or they own the student the securitized student loan debt, or what what have you, right? So we eliminate that too. And then finally, we make employment itself less necessary, less crucial, right? People still will presumably want to work. People will still want to earn money and supplementary money by working. And people, you know, it gives meaning to your life and so forth. But kind of like the job guarantee would do. It would make people a little bit less vulnerable to like being fired, like suddenly, oh, now I'm going to lose all my purchasing power because I've lost this job. And so people can then, you know, kind of choose to be a little bit more choosy in jobs. Uh, employers will have to pay people more to get them to work for them once they have capital incomes as well. You know, so it, it basically just makes for a much more balanced economy. And this is precisely because the composition, uh, the income composition of the economy as a whole is sort of replicated in each individual rather than being kind of skewed where, yeah, okay, it's 90% capital, 10% labor, but, you know, 1% of the population owns all of that capital and 90% of the population does all of that labor. That's a a fundamental imbalance, um, right, between the sort of income composition of the economy on the one hand and then most people's sources of income on the other. If you bring those into sync with one another, you are by definition – establishing a kind of balance. And so you thereby eliminate all of the financial dysfunctions that are rooted in imbalance, all of the other macroeconomic dysfunctions that are rooted in imbalance. And you make people healthier and happier as well, because you got fewer people having to kind of scrape by living from hand to mouth or having to worry that if they get fired by this one, you know, sort of, uh, I don't know, this one sort of dictator and this one, you know, this one asshole boss or something that, you know, their whole lives are going to be ruined or their families are going to starve or something. So I think if you think of the economy as a, as a whole, as a whole, as a whole, as a kind of macrocosm and each individual participant in the economy as a kind of microcosm, the thought here would be that each microcosm should sort of replicate the macrocosm in its income compositional, uh, or sorry, in its income composition. And that's just another way of saying you'd have a kind of income compositional symmetry between those two things. But I think if we do that, if we were to revitalize the labor movement so that it reaches the precariat, the current precariat, instead of just the old traditional industries that it used to be strong in, you bring in the job guarantee uh, as well. And then finally, over the longer term, you bring about a much broader distribution of capital assets over the um, uh, population as a whole. Those are the three best ways, I think, to address the underlying inequality problem that is the ultimate source of or a manifestation of that underlying employment problem. And it is the ultimate source, I think, then of you know the inequality problem that causes so much of our macroeconomic dysfunction and financial dysfunction. Awesome. Uh, well, Bob, I know we're running out of time. I wanted to briefly talk to you about cryptocurrencies, but maybe we'll have to save that for the next conversation. But uh, thank you so much for uh, for coming on. I really appreciate it. And uh, I enjoyed the conversation. Me too, Adam. Thanks so much. This is, uh, these have been great questions and it's great great fun to talk about this stuff. And uh, I'm, I'm actually free for the next, I don't know, probably five or six evenings if you want to do another round on crypto in the coming days. Um, but but if, if not then, then sometime after that too, I'm pretty flexible most of the time. Okay, perfect. So we'll, we'll figure it out. Perfect. Yeah, we can work some. All out. right. All right, Bob, have a good night. Okay. Sounds good, my friend. Thanks a million. Okay, thank you. Good night. Bye-bye. That wraps up the first episode with Bob Hockett. Bob very nicely agreed to do a second episode where we focus mostly on cryptocurrencies and also the future of commercial banking. As always, thank you so much for listening. If you're interested in learning more, you can follow me on Twitter at Adam A. Rice. Please also feel free to follow us on Twitter and Facebook. The Twitter handle is Pocket Change MMT, and the page on Facebook is just Pocket Change Podcast. Thanks again. Mm-hmm.